Well, the U.S. says it plans to push further to get Israel and Palestine to the negotiating table with Secretary of State John Kerry planning a trip to the Middle East. Even so, Washington continues to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the Israeli army, including funding the Iron Dome and a missile system. Artis Paulus Lear has been hearing from those who say the complex just isn't worth it. The brains behind the Iron Dome are Israeli, but the funding is mostly American. When the Americans uh, offer their assistance, it solves the discussion. And offer their assistance they have. Washington recently pledged an additional $680 million for deploying the interceptor system that advocates claim has a success rate of more than 80 percent. I know the correct numbers, I've seen the results, and I uh, endorse them completely. Even Obama has gotten in on the act. His first stop at a recent trip to Israel was to an Iron Dome battery, where he told soldiers they're doing an amazing job. Because so much money has been spent on this defense missile system, it now needs to be marketed and sold. Otherwise, how do you justify something that has already cost the American taxpayer millions of dollars? But for all its hype, the Iron Dome, which is designed to intercept and destroy short-range rockets aimed at populated areas, is not foolproof. I have a lot of question marks. Questions that include the system's effectiveness. Weapons experts in the United States and even in Israel say the IDF has widely overstated its intercept success rate by a factor of 10 or more. You can see very clearly that uh, the trajectory are like this, that it's impossible to hit the warhead of the rocket. So if they said they, they destroyed 84 percent of the incoming rockets. The celebrated technological wonder exploded onto the international stage after last year's Israel-Gaza war. But the maths did not add up. It proved disproportionately expensive as a defense against crude, homemade Palestinian rockets. Hamas uh, 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 militants are, are assembling these rockets, which cost about $100 to make, uh, which are very little more than, than a pipe with some explosive to, to propel it forward. Um, and the Iron Dome rockets uh, um, actually cost $50,000 uh, uh, each rocket. So uh, shooting two rockets to intercept one of the, of the Hamas makeshift bombs, uh, makeshift rockets, would cost a thousand times more than the cost of the rocket that is being intercepted. But the IDF has good reason to mislead the world about its effectiveness. Not only do taxpayers want to know their money is being well spent, but enemies need to be deterred, especially Gaza militants firing at Israel's southern border city of Sterot. It's not the right uh, solution, even more. They developed the Iron Dome to defend Sderot. That was the idea. The only area that the Iron Dome cannot defend is Sderot. Given the history of missile defense deception and the strong Israeli incentive to deceive, the people who pay for the system should be asking hard questions about how well it really works. Paul Uslia, RT, Tel Aviv. Well, the U.S. says it plans to push further to get Israel and Palestine to the negotiating table with Secretary of State John Kerry planning a trip to the Middle East. Even so, Washington continues to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on the Israeli army, including funding the Iron Dome and a missile system. Artis Paulus Lear has been hearing from those who say the complex just isn't worth it. The brains behind the Iron Dome are Israeli, but the funding is mostly American. When the Americans uh, offer their assistance, it solves the discussion. And offer their assistance they have. Washington recently pledged an additional $680 million for deploying the interceptor system that advocates claim has a success rate of more than 80 percent. I know the correct numbers, I've seen the results, and I uh, endorse them completely. Even Obama has gotten in on the act. His first stop at a recent trip to Israel was to an Iron Dome battery, where he told soldiers they're doing an amazing job. Because so much money has been spent on this defense missile system, it now needs to be marketed and sold. Otherwise, how do you justify something that has already cost the American taxpayer millions of dollars? But for all its hype, the Iron Dome, which is designed to intercept and destroy short-range rockets aimed at populated areas, is not foolproof. I have a lot of question marks. Questions that include the system's effectiveness. Weapons experts in the United States and even in Israel say the IDF has widely overstated its intercept success rate by a factor of 10 or more. You can see very clearly that uh, the trajectory are like this, that it's impossible to hit 
the warhead of the rocket. So if they said they, they destroyed 84% of the incoming rockets. The celebrated technological wonder exploded onto the international stage after last year's Israel-Gaza war. But the maths did not add up. It proved disproportionately expensive as a defense against crude, homemade Palestinian rockets. Hamas uh, 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 militants are, are assembling these rockets, which cost about $100 to make, uh, which are very little more than, than a pipe with some explosive to, to propel it forward. Um, and the Iron Dome rockets uh, um, actually cost $50,000. Uh, uh, each rocket, so uh, shooting two rockets to intercept one of the of the Hamas makeshift bombs, uh, makeshift rockets would cost a thousand times more than the cost of the rocket that is being intercepted. But the IDF has good reason to mislead the world about its effectiveness. Not only do taxpayers want to know their money is being well spent, but enemies need to be deterred especially Gaza militants firing at Israel's southern border city of Sturot. It's not the right uh, solution, even more. They developed the Iron Dome to defend Sturot. That was the idea. The only area that the Iron Dome cannot defend is Sturot. Given the history of missile defense deception and the strong Israeli incentive to deceive, the people who pay for the system should be asking hard questions about how well it really works. Paulislia RT, Tel Aviv. Now, before we move on to the State of the Union, I wanted to take a moment to discuss the gloomy state of the mainstream press. Now, it's no secret that network evening news continues to lose influence. The so-called Big Three networks uh, and ABC, NBC, and CBS lost nearly 20 million viewers since 1980. And that's more than half of the audience that they once enjoyed. Now, the cable networks have picked up the slack. But despite lofty mottos like fair and balanced, partisan and divisive seems to be the name of this game. And news does take a backseat to spin and opinion, and you can barely hear the real issues over the shouting of the talking heads. Now, from 1983, in 1983, 90% of the U.S. media was owned by 50 companies. Last year, that number shrank to six. Just think about that. Six mega corporations like GE and Disney owning 90% of the media that you consume. Now, of course, print journalism is no exception, struggling to stay relevant at a time when tweets, blogs, and online media floods through the gates, which the newspapers once kept. And it's not just influence, but revenues and readership that newspapers are losing. Now, it seems like there has been a transformation of sorts from watchdog journalism to lapdog journalism. Corporate officials, war generals, lobbyists, senior administration officials are all taken at their word, treated with respect. Those who lack good standing with the establishment are marginalized, ridiculed. Just think of Occupy Wall Street, Ron Paul, Julian Assange. Which, of course, brings me to WikiLeaks. Light them all up. Come on, fire. Now, the release of this video, the collateral damage video showing an Apache helicopter attack in Baghdad, ended the era when journalists were the ones to decide which leaks would see the light of day. When the video was released, the establishment press balked. We here at RT covered the story the day that it broke, and we put Julian Assange on air. At first, the other outlets stayed away from him. After all, Assange was described as a terrorist by, I, by our very own government. But it seems that market interests took over, and then everything changed. Before long, Julian Assange became a media darling, gracing the screens of the cable networks. NBC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News. Major publications even partnered up with WikiLeaks to catalog and help release countless previously secret documents. Now, it's no stretch of the imagination to say that Julian Assange is a somewhat controversial figure. He's been driven off the internet, deprived of funding, placed under house arrest, and all this as he fights extradition attempts over sexual allegations. But whether you love or hate the man, it's hard to deny that his actions and WikiLeaks forever changed the face of the media as we know it. Now, two years ago, we invited Mr. Assange to speak on air. And in about two months, we're going to bring him back. Starting in March, in March, Julian Assange is going to host a 10-part series of interview programs on this network. Now, you can love it, you can hate it, you can watch it, you can even skip it. The decision is yours, the show is his. The topics are of his own choosing. So, I found it a little bit odd to understand the headlines when I woke up this morning. 
The Kremlin's mouthpiece selling out to the Russian government. A Kremlin pawn. The Cold War Part 2. Now, it's funny, I didn't really see those kinds of headlines when the major papers worked with WikiLeaks to release information, nor do I recall allegations of Julian Assange as some sort of general electric stooge after he appeared in MSNBC. But I guess as the saying goes, all's fair in love and war. And I suppose when you're bleeding dollars, viewers, and ratings, it's easier to throw mud at others than to clean up here at home. Now, before we move on to the State of the Union, I wanted to take a moment to discuss the gloomy state of the mainstream press. Now, it's no secret that network evening news continues to lose influence. The so-called Big Three networks uh, and ABC, NBC, and CBS lost nearly 20 million viewers since 1980. And that's more than half of the audience that they once enjoyed. Now, the cable networks have picked up the slack, but despite lofty mottos like fair and balanced, partisan and divisive seems to be the name of this game. And news does take a backseat to spin and opinion, and you can barely hear the real issues over the shouting of the talking heads. Now, from 1983, in 1983, 90% of the U.S. media was owned by 50 companies. Last year, that number shrank to six. Just think about that. Six mega corporations like GE and Disney owning 90% of the media that you consume. Now, of course, print journalism is no exception. Struggling to stay relevant at a time when tweets, blogs, and online media floods through the gates, which the newspapers once kept. And it's not just influence, but revenues and readership that newspapers are losing. Now, it seems like there has been a transformation of sorts, from watchdog journalism to lapdog journalism. Corporate officials, war generals, lobbyists, senior administration officials are all taken at their word, treated with respect. Those who lack good standing with the establishment are marginalized, ridiculed. Just think of Occupy Wall Street, Ron Paul, Julian Assange. Which, of course, brings me to WikiLeaks. Light them all up. Come on, fire. Now, the release of this video, the collateral damage video showing an Apache helicopter attack in Baghdad, ended the era when journalists were the ones to decide which leaks would see the light of day. When the video was released, the establishment press balked. We here at RT covered the story the day that it broke, and we put Julian Assange on air. At first, the other outlets stayed away from him. After all, Assange was described as a terrorist by, I, by our very own government. But it seems that market interests took over, and then everything changed. Before long, Julian Assange became a media darling, gracing the screens of the cable networks. NBC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, Major publications even partnered up with WikiLeaks to catalog and help release countless previously secret documents. Now, it's no stretch of the imagination to say that Julian Assange is a somewhat controversial figure. He's been driven off the internet, deprived of funding, placed under house arrest, and all this as he fights extradition attempts over sexual allegations. But whether you love or hate the man, it's hard to deny that his actions and WikiLeaks forever changed the face of the media as we know it. Now, two years ago, we invited Mr. Assange to speak on air. And in about two months, we're going to bring him back. Starting in March, in March Julian Assange is going to host a 10-part series of interview programs on this network. Now, you can love it, you can hate it, you can watch it, you can even skip it. The decision is yours, the show is his. The topics are of his own choosing. So, I found it a little bit odd to understand the headlines when I woke up this morning. The Kremlin's mouthpiece selling out to the Russian government, a Kremlin pawn. The Cold War Part 2? Now, it's funny, I didn't really see those kinds of headlines when the major papers worked with WikiLeaks to release information, nor do I recall allegations of Julian Assange as some sort of general electric stooge after he appeared in MSNBC. But I guess as the saying goes, all's fair in love and war. And I suppose when you're bleeding dollars, viewers, and ratings, it's easier to throw mud at others than to clean up here at home. Well, stay tuned to RT next week for our continuing coverage of the Occupy Wall Street protests. The mainstream media networks might be quick to shine the spotlight away from the protests, but RT is on the ground, and we're not leaving until the protesters do. In New York this weekend, police are threatening to evict Occupy Wall Street camps, but protesters are holding their ground. And from coast to coast, the movement is spreading from Wall Street to Main Street, and Americans from every walk of life are picking sides and we'll be there when they do. Plus, forget green technology. What if I told you there was a nuclear reactor
that couldn't melt down, created cheap energy, and burned old we weapons stockpiles. Is this a pipe dream, or could it be for real? And how soon could it be coming to an energy grid near you? Plus, it's a meeting of the economic minds. The G20 is gathering once again, this time in France. And they certainly have a lot to catch up on, including the European debt crisis, global unemployment, and poverty, just to name a few. But with all these issues and so little time, will anything actually come out of this meeting? We'll be on the ground in Cannes with the very latest. Those are just some of the stories we have on tap for you next week, along with much more news and in-depth interviews. So keep it tuned right here to RT. Well, stay tuned to RT next week for our continuing coverage of the Occupy Wall Street protests. The mainstream media networks might be quick to shine the spotlight away from the protests, but RT is on the ground, and we're not leaving until the protesters do. In New York this weekend, police are threatening to evict Occupy Wall Street camps, but protesters are holding their ground. And from coast to coast, the movement is spreading from Wall Street to Main Street, and Americans from every walk of life are picking sides, and we'll be there when they do. Plus, forget green technology. What if I told you there was a nuclear reactor that couldn't melt down, created cheap energy, and burned old we weapons stockpiles? Is this a pipe dream, or could it be for real? And how soon could it be coming to an energy grid near you? Plus, it's a meeting of the economic minds. The G20 is gathering once again, this time in France. And they certainly have a lot to catch up on, including the European debt crisis, global unemployment, and poverty, just to name a few. But with all these issues and so little time, will anything actually come out of this meeting? We'll be on the ground in Cannes with the very latest. Those are just some of the stories we have on tap for you next week, along with much more news and in-depth interviews. So keep it tuned right here to RT.